Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today in our uh, Mayor Brown CLE on financing alternatives for banks. I'm Brad Berman and I am counsel here in the Capital Markets Department at Mayor Brown, do a lot of work with banks, a lot of structured products, joined by Anthony Ragazzino. Yeah, good afternoon, Anthony Ragazzino. I'm a managing director at RBC Capital Markets and I co-head our financial institutions debt capital markets business. Glad to be with you today. And just today, we're going to cover current market trends. Um, we'll be discussing register, registration and exemptions from registration, uh, regulatory issues, the disclosure requirements, practices for exempt offerings, and some other matters. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll be focusing, by the way, today in the fixed income area. And I just cover this slide very quickly. Bank debt, what do we see? Senior secured, unsecured, sub debt. Structured debt, many times banks finance with structured products, programs, preferred stock. The issuers can be U.S. banks. It could be home offices of foreign banks, branches of foreign banks. There are other affiliated entities, bank holding companies. In the formats, uh, 3A2 for banks, 144A offerings. Uh, we'll go through both of those in SEC registered. So, Anthony, why don't you kind of give us this current state of the market? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brad. Um, as we said, we're going to be talking a bit about market developments. So we've got a few pages here that go over um, a number of different types of banks, as well as different types of asset classes that, that Brad alluded to. Um, the first page here looks at senior unsecured debt. And this is kind of a snapshot of what we've seen year to date so far in 2021. We break each of these segments down by the Yankee banks, the domestic banks, and then the money center banks. So for those purposes, the domestic banks are basically all of the U.S. banks other than the money centers. So it includes the regional banks, trust banks, and some of the card banks, et cetera, all lumped into that category. Uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see um, numbers that indicate volumes year to date relative to last year. Um, and as you'll know, for the domestic bank category, volumes are down pretty significantly relative to last year. Um, you know, there's a lot of elevated liquidity in the system last year due to some of the regulatory intervention matters during the crisis. Um, there's also been a change in the way Moody's looks at their credit analysis uh, of banks uh, and made some adjustments to their methodology that wound up having the impact for a number of banks of reducing the amount of, uh, of debt funding that they need to do in order to maintain their rating. So those are just a couple of contributing factors to why you see that number down so low. Both the Yankees and the money centers were both up a uh, fairly, fairly sizable amount year over year so far. Uh, you know, the money centers were given greater latitude earlier in the year from the Fed to increase their capital return um, policies through dividends and share buybacks. That helped lead to some incremental funding um, as well as just you know replacing some maturing bonds. Um, we also at the bottom of the table for anyone who's curious just to do a little bit more of a granular dive on this to see the composition of the various senior debt instruments that these banks have issued break it down by tenor. So if you want to just look at you know the two to four spot for example or the seven to eight year you'll see which were the more predominant tenors used by the different bank categories throughout the course of this year so far. And sometimes that sort of ebbs and flows based on uh, on maturity profiles, uh, current rate environment, uh, you know, desire to lock in rates for longer. You might see some longer tenors looking at that strategy. So a number of factors go into the tenor and figuring out what a particular bank might need for its capital structure. Melissa, if you could please move to the next slide. So now we go a little bit down the capital structure, very similar construct on the page for ease of reference, but this is now looking at subordinated debt. And you'll see for all three categories of banks here, uh, they're up pretty meaningfully year over year. Last year was not a very popular year for a tier two subordinated debt. Um, this year has been an opportunity for a number of banks to look to optimize their uh, capital structures by using tax deductible capital, uh, as well as financing uh, refinancing a number of amortizing tier two bonds that are, you know, going closer toward maturity when they start losing some regulatory credit. And it makes sense at some points in time to take those out at or before that final maturity date. 
We've also seen in, in the dynamic, a very favorable fixed income market, the compression in pricing um, between senior debt and sub debt has been quite notable this year. That differential has, has tightened to about 15, 15 to 20 basis points, which is pretty notable. And that makes sub debt a bit more attractive now than it might be in other years when that differential is a bit more significant. Uh, we'll also see that uh, there have been a number of callable structures um, coming into popularity in the tier two space. Uh, the regulators have approved a, a 15 non-call 10 structure um, with, with different types of backends. We've seen a number of 10 non-call fives um, and some, and, and as well as some bullet structures. But in the callables, those backends are tending toward either five-year U.S. Treasury resets or some form of a SOFR floating rate backend in light of LIBOR's uh, eventual phase out. If we can uh, skip to the next page, please. Thank you. Uh, and on the last page, same kind of snapshot, but looking at the preferred stock market. Uh, and you'll see on the right side, all bank segments are up significantly year over year when it comes to issuing preferred stock. This has been uh, just an incredibly robust environment for banks to achieve all-time tight uh, spreads and coupons on preferred stock. So there's been a strong desire across the universe of banks to lock in uh, super low rates for longer. You'll see that there's a distribution between folks doing fixed for life securities in this format, in which case they print an initial coupon and that's the rate they pay for per perpetuity or until they call the instrument. And then there's also still a fair amount of popularity among the fixed rate reset structures, which might have a lower front end coupon, but then have a reset mechanism where the coupon resets every five years. So again, a number of issuers will weigh that calculus and just decide, you know, what's right for them. Do they want to just take a coupon that might be slightly higher, but still historically low and lock it in in perpetuity? Or do they want to just look at this and say, look, for the next five years, I can get a super, super low rate, even lower than the fixed rate market. Let me do that now uh, and take advantage of that super low funding. So just, you know, this is another thing where we, we lay at the bottom of this table, the different formats that we've seen in these structures, fixed for life, fixed and float, uh, some of them with non-call five periods, seven periods or 10 periods. Again, all these things are, you know, very issuer specific determinations as to what's the right structure for them, given their strategy, given their capital structure planning uh, and what's going on with the, with the market backdrop. We can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So just staying on the preferred theme for a moment, I've got a couple more pages on that because we do spend a fair amount of time working with clients uh, on preferreds. So this is a bit, these two pages are a bit of a deeper dive on that asset class. Focusing here for the moment, just to manage the data efficiently on the U.S. bank space, uh, we've got like a three-year snapshot here of volumes and number of deals. Um, and, and as you can see from 1919, pre-COVID, we saw about $20 billion raised in the preferred market. Last year, we saw about $30 billion. This year, we're at about $34 billion to the plus. Uh, with still two months remaining. So there will probably be a few more deals before year end. So that'll put 2021 on pace to be a pretty significant year relative to 2020, which historically was a significant, significant amount of preferred stock issuance. Uh, notably too, what we've seen uh, in the course of the past few quarters, um, not only a, a large number of deals, but we've seen large size deals. So we had six of the 11 largest preferred issuance over the course of this three-year horizon occur in the three quarters of 2021. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, deals that are, you know, over $3 billion in some cases, some of them two plus billion dollars. So fairly sizable deals relative to historical standards. So just again, just a reflection of, of demand in the market for the product. Uh, you know, and willingness for investors to go down the capital structure to pick up some incremental yield in what's been, you know, a very prolonged low yield environment, low rate environment. What are some of the drivers? So again, you know, we've got a few months left in the year, we might see a few more issuances. Um, people are still taking advantage of a robust market, looking to print all in, you know, tight coupons relative to their historical issuances. We still have uh, the LIBOR phase out 
on top of mind for a number of issuers. Federal Reserve and the other bank agencies have come out very forcefully saying that they want banks to manage their LIBOR exposure, not entering into any new LIBOR-based contracts uh, after this calendar year, and certainly working toward the end of this calendar year to have a, a, an efficiently managed plan in place for dealing with their legacy LIBOR uh, uh, exposures. So, you know, that too, you know, continues to lead to a number of refinancings, uh, putting new preferreds in the market to take out old LIBOR-based preferreds. And then lastly, I would just note, which I alluded to on one of the earlier pages, is that there's been, you know, a fair amount of um, flexibility given to the larger banks to resume and increase their capital return uh, metrics by way of dividends and share buybacks. So by uh, doing that, uh, a number of banks have taken advantage of the preferred market to raise tier one capital in a more cost efficient form, buy back some more stock and still maintain fairly robust capital levels. If we could advance to the next slide, please. Uh, the last page I'll talk about here uh, and, and then turn it back over to Brad is some structural nuances. So getting a little bit in the weeds here, but these are things that are, are very important as we think about designing a particular security for a given issuer who's looking to access the preferred market. There is a fair amount of flexibility in how you can design these instruments. Um, as I alluded to earlier, the dividend convention is a very important one because it factors in cost, you know, duration, financial flexibility, et cetera. So we're looking at fixed for life versus the fixed rate reset structures. And if you look at the top right bar graph here, this just shows you over the last few years what the composition has been. Um, and there's been a fair amount in both formats, again, largely dictated by the fact that each issuer is looking to manage to its own objectives. So it's not like there's uniformly you know, one answer that makes sense for everybody. So you'll still see a fair amount of that variation. Um, and some of that, you know, is also a reflection on people's views on, on rates going forward. So it could be an attractive time if you think we're going to have an accelerating rate environment to lock in that fix for life for a longer period of time. Again, other considerations go into that. It still winds up being in the current environment, a slightly higher coupon than the fixed rate reset structures. And typically those are designed for the retail market which tends to have a higher fee structure associated with it than the fixed rate reset structures that are designed for the institutional market, which typically has a lower fee structure. So multiple variables going into figuring out what's the right instrument for a given issuer. And I think that's you know clearly reflected in that bar graph that shows numerous structures still being used when it comes to the dividend rate convention. Uh, bottom left, call frequency. This is another really important issue because this is a trade-off very often between cost in terms of your upfront coupon and financial flexibility, meaning uh, how often can you take a crack at the apple to redeem some or all of the security down the road once it becomes callable after the initial non-call period. So for a while, um, we had structures that were being done with a regular call, which basically means they can be called at par on any dividend payment date. So whether it was a quarterly pay instrument or a semi-annual pay instrument, uh, after that initial non-call five or non-call 10 period, the issuer had the right to call it at par on those, on those payment dates. When we started switching to this structure that was the fixed rate reset, which basically said after the first five years, let's say, you're now going to reset the coupon for another five years as opposed to what historically had been those back ends, which were three months floaters, this would reset every three months. Now we're resetting and locking in a coupon for another five years. That sort of changed the calculus about how we think about the call feature. And there, at, at first, when we first started putting in these fixed rate reset structures, uh, the investors were very much focused on this and concerned about their back end risk. Um, and there was this notion of using discrete calls which basically means the issuer could only take the security out once every five years in connection with those periodic reset dates. Um, and there was at least a perceived difference in the marketplace, um, a pricing difference between having that discrete call, which was more preferred by investors, uh, and, and having an issuer have greater flexibility to call on every dividend payment date, which would be less desirable by investors. 
over time, we've seen a bit more of a gravitation toward a more regular call structure, meaning quarterly or semi-annual calls, and the marketplace accepting that as being, I won't go so far as to say a new norm because we still do see some discrete call structures being used for certain issuers, but the investor community has largely come around to embracing that more regular call without adding any meaningful cost in terms of additional coupon for the issuer. Uh, last point I would note, a bit of a minor point, but still a very important one um, when banks think about how they manage their capital structure and regulations that they're subject to with respect to how they manage their capital structure. And that's represented in the bottom right-hand graph, the call notice period. So as, as, as many of you probably know, for most of the US banks, if you're going to redeem or replace one of your capital instruments, you need to get regulatory approval in order to do that. So um, there's this issue of, you know, do you have to deal with paying two coupons in terms of issuing a new security while the other one is still outstanding because you have a notice period? Let's say you have to give a 30 day notice period in order to redeem an outstanding preferred you'll want to get regulatory approval before you send out that 30 day notice period. So if, if you are looking to get your new proceeds in hand um, before you send out that notice period or around the same, same time you send out that notice period, you'd be carrying uh, the full coupon on two securities for a full 30 days. So the notion here around this call period notice provision is you know, can we possibly do a shorter notice period so that that double carry, uh, if you will, is, is not quite as impactful so that maybe you're carrying, you know, two coupons for a much shorter period of time. So what I would say on that is, you know, for, for a lot of these deals that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, that exchange has a listing requirement that mandates a minimum notice call period of 30 days. So for those, there's not really much flexibility for this. For NASDAQ listed securities, that minimum notice period is only five days. So that gives issuers, again, greater flexibility that if they want to issue a new security, then send out the redemption notice for the outstanding security, they only have to carry those two coupons for five days. Um, and then we've seen for deals that are listed on neither exchange, for example, 144A market transactions, We've seen a bit of a variation, but a gravitation toward five or 10 day period with 10 days probably being, you know, the most common. Just another point to keep, you know, keep in mind, it factors into, you know, issuers, minds, and, uh, you know, sometimes investors will focus on this as well. Um, with that said, why don't I turn it back over to Brad to hit some of the uh, next points on the agenda. Okay, thanks, Anthony. That was great. Um, so let's talk about uh, Section 382. And it's, I'm going to discuss in the context of banknote programs, because frequent bank issuers tend to set up these medium term note programs so they can just move quickly as the market allows. Uh, how do you have a 382 banknote program? Well, the issuer or the guarantor is to be a bank, which is a defined term. We'll talk about that. And of course, these are exempt from registration. Next slide. Uh, what do we see on these programs? Talked about this a little earlier, senior subordinated, a lot of fixed or floating rate notes, structured securities. Um, these programs are typically rated investment grade, uh, and I'll talk about why. Uh, a lot of times, if you're in the structured note area, there can be linked to reference assets that you know, you're know not always seen or allowed in registered programs, such as, for example, Credit link nodes are very complex underlying assets. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we do this? Well, you, the issuer has to be, or the guarantor of the security, a bank. And uh, the basis of this is the idea is banks are very regulated. They're subject to capital requirements, are already providing adequate disclosure to investors about their finances. The idea is there's a pretty good likelihood that basically they'll pay their debts like a bank debt security. Uh, next slide, please. So to be a bank under section 382, what do you have to do? Well, it has to be a, you have to be a national bank or any institution supervised by a state banking commission. So a state or national bank and your business has to be confined to banking. 
Now, there are a number of things that sound like banks, but they're not banks for purposes of 382. For example, bank holding companies, and we'll talk about them later, finance companies, investment banks, non-US or foreign banks aren't banks. Now, regulated US branches and agencies of foreign banks may qualify. So let's go to the next slide. And I mentioned that you could have a security guaranteed by a bank and that'll get you into the 382 exception from registration. So uh, the guarantee isn't limited to a guarantee in a legal sense, but it include other arrangements. When you kind of look at the no action letters, there's a lot of letter of credit type arrangements that constitute guarantee for purposes of 382. But for one thing, it has to be cover the entire obligation. It can't be partial. It's got to be an unconditional guarantee. If the guarantee was by a non-US bank other than by its eligible US branch or agency, that wouldn't qualify for the exemption. And of course, this is really a legal requirement to meet the exemption. Uh, if you have, for example, a non-US bank is the issuer, the guarantor is its US branch or agency. So the guarantee is issued by a bank. Investors are going to look to that the home office for payment if there's an issue. And this is how finance companies can issue under 382 as long as they have a security guaranteed by a bank. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see, uh, and how, so how do these non-US banks with their US offices get into this? Well, there's a conditional exemption. Uh, the, in 1986, the SEC in a no action letter, they essentially said, a foreign branch or agency will be deemed to be a national bank or a state bank, as long as it has very similar, the nature and extent of the federal or state regulation uh, is substantially equivalent to the applicable state chartered uh, and domestic banks doing business in the same jurisdiction. So as a result, you have many US branches or agencies of foreign bank, they're frequent issuers or more likely guarantors of debt securities in the US. And uh, many times these branches are the New York branches of these, uh, of these banks. There's a, a uh, link when you get the materials, you can find a list of them. Next slide, please. This just briefly, I won't go over this, but these are some kind of brand names in the space, direct issuer, guarantor with headquarters of the issuer. And again, uh, if it's a New York branch, they have elected for the New York State Department of Financial Services as their regulator, usually with their secondary regulators, the Federal Reserve. But some branches have opted for the OCC as their primary regulator. In that case, those branches become national banks. Uh, next slide, please. So if you are a branch that has opted to be um, regulated by the OCC, uh, you have a slight issue in that if you want to issue uh, securities, you're going to have to comply with the OCC securities offering regulations. Now, you may say, hey, wait a second. You just said there was an exemption from the 33 Act for banks, and there was a whole policy reason behind it. And that's very true, but national banks aren't so lucky. So um, the national bank, the OCC regs essentially mirror the 33 Act regs saying, hey, if you can't find an exemption, you have to actually file a registration statement with the OCC. And that registration statement looks a whole lot like, and it's the same scope as the Securities Act registration statement. So national banks have ways to avoid registering. Um, Section 16.5 of the Part 16 rules, they can do Reg D offerings, Rule 140, 4A offerings to QUIBS, Reg S, uh, nowadays, of course, if they're doing Reg D or 144A, there's general solicitation is allowed. Of course, also the Rule 506 bad actor disqualifications would also apply. And that's kind of an interesting point because when Dodd-Frank brought, brought in the whole bad actor thing, that was really aimed at kind of shady characters. Um, however, because of the way 16.6 is written, uh, the national banks, too, have to do the same type of bad actor diligence to assure that they can use the Reg D uh, exemption under 16.5. Next slide, please. But the more regular issuance we see for national banks is what the, the 16.6, and this is a partial exemption for 
a non-convertible debt sold to accredited investors in large denominations, 250000 or more. And uh, federal branches or agencies as issuers uh, can rely on this exemption by furnishing to the OCC uh, parent bank information required under the Exchange Act, uh, same type of into purchasers information, the same uh, information required under Rule 144A. We'll talk about that a little later. Now, the securities have to be investment grade, and this used to be just get a rating, but after Dodd-Frank, when there was a jihad against rating agencies, they now a new definition kind of focuses on the the uh, chances of repayment. Uh, and then there's a post-sale filing within five days. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's see, the New York, uh, by the way, New York branches or agencies of foreign banks, if you're gonna issue bank notes, you should talk to the NYDFS first. They won't stand in your way, but it's a good idea to let them, let them know. Now their agencies of foreign banks are rarer, but there are New York regulations uh, requiring uh, getting a no objection letter from the NYDFS, uh, minimum denominations of 100,000 in sales to institutional purchasers. Um, anyway, so a little tweak for New York uh, agencies and branches. Branches tend to issue notes in 250,000 minimum denominations anyways. Uh, next slide, please. Now, FINRA, another regulatory scheme you cannot avoid is FINRA. Uh, even though you have an exemption from 3A2 under the 33 Act, uh, these are considered public securities. So unless uh, you find an exemption from, from making a filing under FINRA, you're, you'll have to make a filing. And the typical exemption is having outstanding investment grade rated unsecured non-convertible debt or rate the securities that are going to going to be issued. Uh, one of the bigger issues uh, when doing an offering is typically a bank will have an affiliated dealer that they're going to use as an agent for the offering. That, under the federal rules, is considered a conflict of interest. So you solve that by having what they call prominent disclosure about the conflict of interest. And guess what? You have to get the securities rated. So going back to the OCC 16.6 requirements, when Dodd-Frank removed the rating requirement and said, oh, you do a self-evaluation. Well, if your bank, like most banks, is an affiliated broker-dealer, you got to get a rating anyways. Uh, these transactions are reported through Trace, as are 144A securities too. Uh, next slide, please. And the other thing is denominations, an interesting area. There's nothing in 3A2 that says you have to have a specific minimum of denominations, but these tend to be higher denominations. Uh, a lot of times offerings are targeted to uh, institutional investors. They don't want retail investors uh, investing in some of these securities that might be very complex securities. You got a relationship to 16.6 and the 250,000 minimum denominations. And of course, regulated agencies and branches under New York have their own issues about keeping the denominations high. Uh, next slide. Another area to watch out for is blue sky or the state securities law, but most of this is resolved because 3A2 securities are considered covered securities under the Securities Act, but however, because they're not listed on a national securities exchange, the states could require notice filing and a fee. Uh, generally, they do not do that but it's a good idea to check the blue sky laws, particularly if the issuer is an agency or a branch, uh, that might be a little trickier under the state blue sky laws. And if you're going to do a 144A offering, that's a little easier. You're just within the state's institutional purchaser document uh, exemption. Uh, next slide, please. So what does the offering documentation look like? Well, it looks like a lot like uh, that of a registered offering. You have a base offering document called an offering memorandum or circular instead of a prospectus. If it's a non-U.S. issuer, you want to have IFRS financials, a home country gap. If you do that, if it's a uh, non-U.S. gap or non-IFRS, you're going to want a reconciliation footnote. The best thing market prefers U.S. gap financials. The market's also 
looking for annual audit and at least semi-annual and audited financial statements and typically include guide three type statistical disclosures required of U.S. issuers or something similar. Uh, you can have pricing supplements, product supplements, and other, other materials too. Next slide, please. So let's go talk about the registered alternatives. Well, this is for bank holding companies. Uh, Bank holding companies offer registered securities through the shelf registration statements. Um, these are Exchange Act reporting companies. They've got publicly available financial information, including audited financial statements. There's a lot of certainty here. You don't have to worry whether you're meeting an exemption. And then there's the advantage of speed that most bank holding companies are Wixies or well-known season issuers. They have automatic shelf registration statements and they can incorporate by reference most of the offering document for, from their Exchange Act report. So that leads to kind of a slimmer offering document. So let's return to Anthony with a question here. So let's say you have a family, the hold code's on top, the bank is below. How do you decide, why would they decide to issue, maybe they could do the hold code or they could do exempt. What, what are the advantages or disadvantages? Yeah, so that's a, it's a great question. And, you know, there are a number of different ways to look at this. I think there are legal, regulatory, and, and business slash commercial reasons that go into that analysis. Um, if you're thinking about issuing at the holding company versus, you know, one of the one of the bank subsidiaries, I think, you know, one of the first questions that, that one would ask is, where do you need the proceeds? Um, you know, there are some simple structures where it's just a holding company and a bank. And then there are plenty of more complex structures where there might be multiple bank subsidiaries, multiple non-bank subsidiaries. So a question arises as to, you know, where do you need the proceeds? If you need to deploy them, you know, more broadly across one or more of your subsidiaries, you might pursue a hold co-financing and then be able to allocate the proceeds to the different places where you need them. If you're just at the bank level and you need the funding there for whatever purposes, whether you're refinancing a bank bond, for example, or you want to, um, you know, you want to acquire some some uh, high quality liquid assets to 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 help with your liquidity coverage metrics. Then you could issue at the bank level. So I think the first and you know foremost question is, you know, where do you need the proceeds? Um, you know, after that, uh, there's a question of where. What about your cost of funding? You know, where can you get your most efficient cost of funding? So if you're if you're indifferent on where you need the proceeds, in uh, most cases issuing at the bank level is going to provide a lower cost of funding. Um, and that's, you know, usually for a couple of reasons. One being it tends to be a higher rated security than bank issuance. Um, the bank debt is structurally senior to holding company debt. It's so-called closer to the assets. So there's some element of investor preference for buying paper at the bank level. Um, so, you know, that, that will matter too. Whereas, um, you know, if, if, if you, again, need proceeds more broadly distributed, um, you know, you, you might not be able to take advantage of the lower funding that you could achieve at the bank and you just have to deal with paying a little bit more for hold co-funding um, and distributing the assets, uh, where the proceeds where you need them. Uh, other factors that come in when you think about uh, bank funding is there's the, there's the UDA benefit, the unsecured debt adjustment, which is something that, that gets factored into the calculation of the FDIC insurance premium that a bank needs to pay the FDIC for its deposit insurance. And it's a complicated formula, but one of the inputs on that formula is how much unsecured bank debt do you have outstanding? And up to a certain limit, you can issue bank debt and that has the effect of reducing the amount of the premium you pay to the FDIC for your deposit insurance. That does not exist at the holding company. So again, you're thinking about this in terms of cost, you're going to have a lower coupon by issuing at the bank because it's a higher rated piece of paper and you could potentially get this UDA benefit which reduces your FDIC insurance premium. So you factor all of those things in and you have a net cost of issuance at the bank that could be meaningfully lower than your cost of funding at the holding company. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other, you know, regulatory issues to take into account, whether it's LCR or NSFR requirements. For some of the larger banks, there's the TLAC rule that they have to manage too. 
um, if you're issuing a capital instrument, there are rules that regulate um, how you treat that on a consolidated basis if you issue it out of a subsidiary. Whereas issuing at the holding company, you get full credit toward your consolidated capital metrics. There is a rule that limits the amount of bank issued capital that can be included in that consolidated metric. Now, granted, about a year and a half ago, the Fed amended that rule to make it a bit more liberal, but it still is a metric that needs to be run to see if it's a constraint because it wouldn't be optimal to issue you know, a capital instrument at the bank if, for example, you'll only get 80 or 90% credit for that on your consolidated capital metrics. So a, a number of factors that go into that. I think from an investor perspective, you know, Brad hit on a, an important point about the disclosure differences between the two. Clearly that's something that investors are going to be focused on. But again, there's, there's this notion of being closer to the assets, having a higher rated instrument, having structural seniority to hold code debt um, that all weighs in favor from an investor's perspective of owning bank paper uh, versus, versus holding company paper. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Anthony. That was great. And then I guess, you know, as I mentioned before, sometimes if a bank wants to go in the market with a structured product, with it's very complex or linked to something in the SEC, like credit link notes, they're not going to do that on a registration statement. They're going to go in the bank level, go with higher denominations, maybe restricted to accredited investors or something like that. And I think, uh, the other point, kind of a small point, is like I mentioned that on the hold co, there's publicly available audited financials at the bank level. Even though their financials in the offering document may be GAAP, they may or may not be audited. Uh, banks file something called call reports, which you can find them online. They're completely inexplicable and not helpful to investors. But uh, anyways, so let's move on. Now I'm going to talk about 144A offerings in a moment, but just one more question for Anthony is, and again, a very similar question that we talked about registered versus bank level. But sometimes we see banks that are eligible for 3A2 doing a 144A offering to Quibs. Uh, any reason why they would do that? Is there any advantage or disadvantage? Yeah, I, I guess there's, there are a couple of different things when we think about 3A2 and 144A as options. I guess in order in order to be able to do 3A2, um, you need to have a you know U.S. branch or have access to the guarantee that, that Brad alluded to. There are some some FBOs or foreign banks that don't have that, and as a result, 144A might be their only option. Um, for those who do have both options available, uh, there is this notion of still trying to cultivate a 144A market. Um, an issue to quibs there who are interested in buying that paper. Um, so you might see some of that uh, happen. We do see a fair amount of, um, of the foreign banks that come into the U.S. that don't really have the option and just go for the 144A market because that's, that's really their primary alternative for funding. Um, you know, on the, on the flip side of that, the 3A2 offerings are index eligible if they meet a certain size requirement, which I believe is a minimum of $300 million dollars. By contrast, the 144A securities are, are not index eligible. So, you know, that can often help with uh, investors' views about perceived secondary market liquidity, which could impact execution and pricing in the first instance, which could be an advantage for going for 3A2. So, again, like the other issues, a number of different factors to consider in this, in this calculus. But I think by and large, you know, those who have 3A2 available tends to be uh, their preferred method of doing their offerings, whereas those who don't have it available obviously have 144A that they can do. And for those who both have both available, you know, you you likely see more of those in the 3A2 market, but you might still see some of them in the 144A market. Again, just to cultivate that that market, that investor base, demonstrate that you have access to it, uh, et cetera. Brad? Yep. Okay. Uh, yep. Thank you. Next okay. slide, please. Okay. So let's talk about 144A. Uh, and as Anthony mentioned, again, if you can't 
fit into 3A2, you've got another option. And, and this is a clear safe harbor for offerings to institutional investors. You don't have ongoing registration or disc you know, you're not going to become an exchange act reporting company if you do a 144A offering. Benchmark issuers is a very good liquidity. Uh, as Anthony mentioned, you might want to make a splash in the quid market, might be a reason to use it. Um, OCC part 16.5 that I mentioned before, uh, that has, uh, it's one of the ways for a national bank to avoid registration with the OCC. And uh, you just have, there, you're selling restricted securities, not pub, 3A2 is exempt or public securities. These are restricted securities to qualified institutional buyers or, or quibs. Uh, next slide, please. The reason this exists is basically not all investors need pers the prospectus protection under the Securities Act. So, and it's a resale rule. It applies to persons other than the issuer. I'll go into, go into that. Um, the securities can't be the same class as securities listed on an exchange, which is never going to happen for a bank anyways. And then anybody who buys a, a 144A security can resell it to other quibs or use any other exemption regulation as rule 144. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there, uh, if an issuer, uh, this is a, an attractive offering for an issuer that's not registered in the US, many times they'll do standalone offerings, but we also, there are 144A continuous offering programs. Again, these are like medium term note programs. We'll see financial institution insurance company issuers selling to uh, quibs. And this, again, we'll see structured products sold to quibs under these types of programs. Next slide. So how, how does this work? Well, the issuer initially does a private placement to what they call the initial purchaser. Think of that as the underwriter in a registered offering in a 4A2 or Reg D private placement. And then that bank can uh, immediately turn around and reoffer and resell the securities to Quibs under 144A. And this is often combined with a Reg S offering. Now, just to pause here, the reason this is kind of special is if you didn't have 144A and you bought something in a 4A, if the issuer sold to the investment bank in a private placement, they couldn't immediately resell it. Uh, they'd have to have a holding period for a while or else it would be you know, a, considered an unregistered distribution. So, but 144A solves that and says, by the way, if you're just selling directly to Quibs, you're not selling to the public, it's not a distribution. So that's the, the theory behind it. Uh, next slide, please. So again, uh, the conditions, you can only sell to quibs or a purchaser, the reseller reasonably believes in, to be a quib. You have to make sure when you're selling, the buyer knows they're buying under 144A. Uh, if the issuer is not an Exchange Act reporting company or exempt, the holder and a prospective buyer can have the right to obtain from the issuer upon request certain reasonably current information. Uh, next slide, please. And quibs are essentially large institutions. The main group are, they're buying 100 million in securities uh, of non-affiliates. Uh, corporations, partnerships, there are broker dealers that own or invest 10 million of non-affiliated securities, uh, investment companies that can be part of a family that can have 100 million of, of non-affiliated securities, and then banks, banks uh, also uh, with large investments. So these are very large investors, and you can form a quib solely for the purpose of conducting a Rule 144A transaction. Next slide, please. So how do you, if you want to resell and you want to make sure you're selling a quib, how do, you, how do you know that the person's a quib? Well, if it's a public company, there might be audited financial statements, SEC filed information. You could look at a securities manual such as Moody's or S&P. You can get a certification. Most common big investment banks have quib questionnaires. They do diligence on, on the uh, customers and they make sure they're, their quibs and the SEC acknowledges that you can use them. There's a number of ways to find information to establish that reasonable belief. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, how do you make sure the reseller knows they're buying a 144A security? Uh, there's a legend on the security. The security basically says, hey, this isn't registered uh, and it's not transferable except under certain conditions. The offering memorandum will usually have a big, not only on the front cover, but there'll be a whole section called transfer restrictions going into this in mind numbing detail. Uh, you'll, the purchaser will agree, get a written agreement that they understand securities can only be resold pursuant to an exemption or if they're registered. And they also have uh, restricted QSIP numbers. Uh, next slide, please. They mentioned that uh, the purchaser has the right to ask the issuer uh, about what current information, what is that? Essentially, it's not that hard, a brief statement about the nature of the business, uh, recent financial statements, uh, if, if possible, audited, it has to be reasonably current. Not really that difficult for any kind of real issuer. Uh, next slide, please. Now, going into uh, Rule 159 into the Securities Act, which technically doesn't apply to 302 or 144A, but has a big impact. And what that rule says is that if you're looking to measure liability for misstatements or omissions when selling a security, you're going to apply it at uh, basically the time of sale. In other words, it's going to be based on all the information that was available to the purchaser at the time they purchased. So consequently, Everybody, whether it's registered, 3A2, 144A, everybody makes sure that all the offering documents have all material information to the investor that's conveyed to them at the time of pricing. And law firms, counsels are going to opine as to the contents of the disclosure package in the case of a public offering. But in the same way, 3A2 or 144A, everybody, all, everybody in the market treats it the same. No misstatements or omissions. At the time of sale, the investor has everything they need to make an investment decision. Next slide. I'm not going to go over this. It's just a handy table you can look at. And uh, let's see. Now we are going to return to Anthony for a, a discussion of a Canadian alternative. Sure. Thanks, Brad. So as I said before, I, I work in the U.S. and, and manage our, our U.S. financial institutions team, but. Uh, my parent company is, is regulated in Canada by OSPI, so we will work closely with our parent in connection with their issuance um, transactions. And you know, over the course of the last couple of years, we developed a security that was intended to provide some benefits that didn't exist under the previous uh, set of securities that we had available to us. And this all really emanated from the, the, the Basel III framework, which is you know, adopted and implemented over the course of the last decade or so, which by and large relegated you know, US and Canadian issuers for the most part to uh, tier one instruments that were fairly straightforward, being common stock and your traditional preferred stock, neither of which provided any kind of a you know, tax deduction or tax benefit, if you will, for the issuer. Um, so, there was a, uh, you know, a, a concerted effort to try to um, develop a structure that could provide the best of both worlds being um, tier one qualifying treatment, but yet tax treatment as a debt instrument. So uh, interest payments thereon could be tax deductible, therefore making it a more cost effective form of capital. So um, we devised this security ultimately called a limited recourse capital note, or you know, more commonly known as LRCNs these days and issued the first of its kind last year. Um, a couple of others have since been issued um, by other banks as well. They, they, you know, there might be some variations uh, in some of the structural nuances, but the basic structural framework is largely the same uh, as it's been approved by OSPI. Uh, as tier one capital. And there's a limit on how much of this can actually be used. It can't just constitute the entire tier one bucket for, for one of the Canadian banks. But just to walk through it quickly, because I think it's it's something interesting um, and something that's not being utilized in the US because the Fed to date has, has maintained a pretty steadfast view on, on common stock and traditional preferred stock being the only forms of, of tier one capital. So if you look, we got a, a structure diagram um, on the upper left there, can kind of walk through it very quickly. So we have the bank that issues 
these LRCNs to investors. They're basically just long dated, uh, long dated bonds. Think of them as 60 year bonds with a non call five period associated with them. They'll pay periodic interest payments. Um, at the same time, the bank is going to deposit uh, a bunch of its preferred stock into a newly created trust. And the idea here is that while investors are buying those bonds on day one, if there were ever some sort of what's referred to as a, a recourse event, you know, a default in the payment of, uh, of interest on those bonds, for example, then the investors would effectively wind up taking hold of the preferred stock that's sitting in that trust and would then be holders of perpetual non-cumulative preferred stock instruments, the more traditional uh, additional tier one capital security. Uh, as a result of the way this is designed and structured and the way both the regulator and the Canadian uh, tax authorities have, have weighed in on this, those interest payments on those LRCNs to investors um, wind up being uh, tax efficient to the issuer. And yet, because these preferred shares are locked up in a trust, ready to be effectively delivered at any point in time, if there were one of these recourse events, the regulator treats it as, uh, as a form of additional tier one capital. So look, these are innovations you know, that continue to take place kind of throughout the world in this post uh, Basel III environment that we've been in. Numerous structures have been put forth to different regulators globally, you know, some of which have been approved and some of which obviously have not been. But we just thought it was interesting to flag this structure here because there have been a few of these deals executed now and could only imagine that going forward, you know, we'd see more of these as well. Brad, anything you wanted to add on that point or any other questions about it? Uh, not on that. I think it's, we'll move on to a couple more mechanical issues about setting up these programs. So if you want to set up a banknote program, uh, there's just some kind of general questions to ask here. Does the bank have an affiliated dealer that might be the lead dealer? That's a pretty common situation. What's the purpose of your banknote program? If it's structured products, you want your lead dealer to understand that market and the requirements. If it's not structured products, then you don't have to. Uh, of course, if it's an affiliated dealer, you have to remember the FINRA, the, um, you're gonna have to get a rating uh, to solve the conflict of interest. Uh, sometimes that dealer will wanna distribute through other third-party dealers in that case, the issuer should check on the uh, the dealers, know your distributor policies. In other words, make sure they're doing diligence on dealers they're signing up down the line. And, uh, you know, you want to start early, doing diligence early in the process in order to identify any potential issues. Next slide, please. Uh, your offering circular, as I mentioned before, it's going to have information similar to that in registration due to liability concerns, which I'll go into in a minute. Uh, national banks, if you're doing 16.6, there's specific content requirements, business description like that in a 10K, terms of the notes, use of proceeds, distribution methods. That's pretty normal stuff to see in a, an offering document. If there's a branch or agency as a guarantor or an issuer, usually very little information about them, just kind of their address and how long they've been around. Uh, if you're as a guarantee, you want to make sure the guarantee is well described. And then if there were uh, uh, structured notes, there'd be product and pricing supplements. Uh, next slide, please. The distribution agreement is, looks just like an MTN distribution agreement for registered offering. The big issue there is, you know, which deliverables uh Comfort letters, officers, certificates, uh, opinions, and for doing the diligence, those are, these types of things want to be the scope of the opinions and negotiated very early in the process. Um, if the issuer has a designated underwriters council, they'll probably have a view as to the particular form. They'll probably have their own form of the distribution agreement they're going to require. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, interesting point. Most bank note programs where the bank, you know, where the bank is the issuer doesn't have an indenture that what they call a fiscal and paying agency agreement. Uh, you want to identify who that's going to be. A lot of times of their form. Generally, indentures aren't used. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is when you have a regulated issuer like a bank, I think there's a certain 
you might call it trust in the that the bank is going to pay regularly. But the important point is your offering documents should point clearly point out the differences between an indenture and a paying agency agreement. For example, you're not going to have a trustee standing in a fiduciary relationship representing the holders. Holders are going to have to do everything themselves. There's an event of default. They have to accelerate their own note. So anyway, some differences should be disclosed. Uh, next slide. Uh, one more slide. So liabilities. Uh, what, what do we have? 144A, 3A2, you don't have the civil liability provisions under Section 11 or 12A2 of the Securities Act. They don't apply. Uh, but you are protected. There's rule uh, section 10B of the Exchange Act, the anti-fraud rule 10B5 they're under. As I mentioned, because of this, your offering documents are going to convey all material information. They're going to have very fulsome risk factors. They're going to look just like a registered offering, um, offering document. Next slide, please. Uh, and what is Rule 10b-5? This applies to all sales of securities registered and exempt. Essentially, you can't make the key one is that middle bullet there. The making of it prohibits the making of any untrue statement of a material fact or the omission of a material fact necessary to make the make the statements made not misleading. That's kind of the key. But the interesting point is if, if a plaintiff comes after you under this, one of the things is they have to prove scienta or intent. And that's pretty darn difficult. Uh, I mean, if there's a mistake in an offering document, it's not going to be by intent. It was probably some kind of accident. So anyways, that's the liability concern. So I uh, just want to thank you. We're running out of time here. If there are any questions, we will address them by email. Uh, a couple of additional resources here that are being highlighted. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Good afternoon.